On this Thursday night, cabinet ministers grilled about foreign meddling. You said repeatedly, unequivocally, that you had no information. Plus, why that conservative MP was asked to apologize. And the investigation into alleged Chinese police stations in Quebec. Fox News under fire again, even from Republicans. I think it's bullshit. The lawsuit exposing the network's inner turmoil and what private texts from its hosts reveal. Athletes take aim. Canada soccer treats the women's game as an afterthought. The skepticism pay equity can be achieved. And comedy in a time of need. People saying that, you know, we really help them. The dynamic duo of Indigenous women delighting crowds. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. There are more developments on foreign interference tonight. The RCMP is investigating what they suspect are two so-called police stations in Quebec. Covert centers police suspect are working on behalf of the Chinese government. It's believed Beijing has set up more than 100 of these around the world to monitor, harass and in some cases repatriate Chinese citizens living abroad. The Mounties say they are working to detect and disrupt what they call foreign state-backed criminal activities at these sites. Well, what we know is that the Chinese community um, has voiced their concern. Some people are being threatened, some people are being intimidated, and we certainly need their cooperation in order to further our investigation. The RCMP would not confirm the exact locations of the centers under investigation, but did say one is in Montreal, the other in Brossard, a suburb on the city's south shore. Last year, the RCMP revealed it's investigating four other so-called Chinese police stations, one in Richmond, B.C., and three in the Toronto area. As well, today, the federal foreign affairs minister testified at a parliamentary committee, and she confirmed a Chinese political operative hoping to work at the Chinese embassy in Ottawa was refused entry to the country. But things got a little heated at this hearing. Mackenzie Gray is in Ottawa and has our top story tonight. Mackenzie. Well, Donna, it was another contentious day on Parliament Hill as the committee looking into foreign election interference saw delays by the Liberals and personal and political attacks from the Conservatives. To be brief, can, you, were, you didn't know anything in December. Can I but just finish my sentence, please, Michael? Well, grilled by opposition so, MPs, the Foreign the Affairs Minister Canada admitted she was kept in the dark about alleged Chinese electoral interference. How is it that the Globe and Mail and Global News have information, but you, as Minister of Foreign Affairs, know nothing? When it comes to activities of foreign actors in the country, the Foreign Affairs Minister was not made aware. And since then, I've made sure that that changed. The government did make its concerns over electoral interference known when the Chinese ambassador was summoned in February. But one step the government hasn't taken, expelling any Chinese diplomats who were involved with the alleged meddling. Instead, Melanie Jolie says the government took the easier path by recently barring a Chinese envoy from coming to Canada. When China wanted to send a political operative last fall, uh, we decided to deny a visa. Jolie added she raised these concerns with her Chinese counterpart, a point Conservative MP you've Michael Cooper tough. seized on. Uh, you've talked tough with your uh, Beijing counterpart, so you say uh, you even stared into his eyes. I'm sure he was very intimidated. Cooper's comments sparking outrage from the opposition. I think it's shameful that that was even said in this place. Yeah, there's a lot of things around this place that make me puke in my mouth often. The condemnation of Cooper came after the committee had been meeting for over four hours. The majority of that time used up by Liberal MPs filibustering to avoid a vote on having the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff, Katie Telford, appear at the committee. Mass shooting inquiry. One Liberal used her time to suggest that a public inquiry into alleged interference would be too costly, referencing the review into the Nova Scotia mass shooting. That cost $25.6 million. So I can only imagine what this public inquiry is going to cost the taxpayer. On top of the House Committee, the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians announced it accepted the Prime Minister's request to have the group of nine MPs with top-level security clearances also study foreign interference. Donna. Okay, Mackenzie Gray in Ottawa, thanks. Foreign interference was also in sharp focus in Washington today as the United States' top intelligence official delivered her annual global threat assessment.
the People's Republic of China, which is increasingly challenging the United States economically, technologically, politically, and militarily around the world, remains our unparalleled priority. The CCP represents both the leading and most consequential threat to U.S. national security and leadership globally. That is American National Intelligence Director Avril Haines. Her threat report largely focused on China. She cited Beijing's growing cooperation with Moscow and its continued push to become the preeminent power. Haines says President Xi Jinping's government is increasingly convinced it can only achieve its goals at the expense of the U.S. and other Western nations. A multi-billion dollar defamation lawsuit against Fox News is pulling the curtain on the inner turmoil at the conservative cable news station. Dominion Voting Systems, a voting machine company, is suing Fox for repeating Donald Trump's lie that the 2020 election was fraudulent. It turns out not only does the channel's most popular host, Tucker Carlson, not believe it was stolen, text messages reveal he hates Trump with a passion. Jackson Prosco on the embarrassing details emerging in this lawsuit. The most watched cable news channel in America finds itself making headlines. We need to find out exactly what happened in this election. After a week that revealed top stars at Fox News pushed lies about the 2020 election, even as they privately admitted what they were saying on air was false. We saw blatant election law violations in state after state. The revelations came as part of a $1.6 billion defamation suit against Fox News launched by Dominion Voting Systems. We talked about the Dominion software. I know that there were voting irregularities. Dominion was the target of extensive conspiracy theories about voting machines after Trump refused to concede the election. President Trump is zeroing in on Dominion voting machines. According to internal emails and text messages obtained as part of the lawsuit, Fox's primetime hosts privately mocked Trump and his advisors as liars, while Fox chairman Rupert Murdoch expressed concern about what his hosts were saying on air. In one unearthed text message, primetime host Tucker Carlson said of former President Trump, I hate him passionately. Fox News has called Dominion's lawsuit a distortion and an effort to smear the company. Yet even away from the courts, Fox's continued attempts to prop up former President Donald Trump have caused serious harm to the network's reputation. These were not insurrectionists, they were sightseers. This week, Carlson aired new footage of the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol, Tucker Carlson, released to him by Republican Speaker of the House Kevin McCarthy. Thousands of hours of tape were selectively edited, an attempt to rewrite history. They're not destroying the Capitol, they obviously revere the Capitol. Even for Republicans, it was a bridge too far. I think it's bullshit. Insiders describe the turmoil as an existential crisis for Fox. I think Fox has abdicated being accepted and treated as a legitimate news organization. What Fox has been doing is inventing falsehoods or adopting falsehoods that were invented by others. In this precarious moment, the one story the network refuses to cover is its own sheltering its loyal audience from any news about Fox News. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. There's been another train derailment in the U.S. involving a Norfolk Southern train. About 30 cars came off the tracks in Alabama. There were no reports of injuries or leaks. Norfolk Southern has a history of accidents, and this morning the company's president and CEO was asked if he would commit to fully cleaning up the toxic spill from last month's train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio. I want to begin today by expressing how deeply sorry I am for the impact this derailment has had on the residents of East Palestine and the surrounding communities. Norfolk Southern will clean the site safely, thoroughly, and with urgency. You have my personal commitment. People there have reported health issues such as rashes and difficulty breathing since rail cars carrying vinyl chloride derailed and burned last month. Now to Ukraine. Russia launched a huge wave of missile and drone strikes today, hitting residential buildings and critical infrastructure right across the country. At least six people were killed. Hundreds of thousands are without heat and electricity. And the nuclear power plant in Zaporizhia was knocked offline again, raising the alarm once more about a nuclear catastrophe. Crystal Gamansing reports. By hand, rubble and bits of metal, likely debris from a missile, are cleared away in hopes of finding survivors. 
but the black bags appear. My second sister called me and said that a rocket hit our other sister's home. She's hopeful but knows her relatives are likely dead. For the most part, the Lviv Oblast in western Ukraine has been spared from deadly strikes. <laughs> Russia, however, unleashed a barrage of countrywide missile and drone attacks it says hit Ukrainian military sites and energy locations supplying the military. Retaliation, says Moscow, for an armed attack in a Russian border village allegedly by opponents of Vladimir Putin fighting for Ukraine. This is the sixth time that the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant has lost all of site power. The main line that supplies power to cool reactors at Europe's largest nuclear power plant was knocked offline for several hours. The nuclear watchdog agency, which has employees at the site, has been trying to get both sides to agree to a safety zone for months to no avail. One day, our luck will run out. In the strikes, Russia says it's used Kinjal hypersonic missiles. Kinjal means dagger. They can carry nuclear materials and are hard to detect by air defense systems. The West has to supply Ukraine with everything it needs. For example, the fighter jets. It needs to supply long-range weapons so that Ukraine can strike legitimate military targets uh, within Russia. And thirdly, um, influential states like India and Israel um, should get off the fence and help support Ukraine. So far, there have been no announcements about providing Ukraine with fighter jets or changing the rules around donated weapons allowing Ukraine to strike outside of its territory. Ukraine's president addressed the deadly strikes, saying everyone is working together to ensure the invincibility of Ukraine. Donna? All right, Crystal, thanks. German police say several people are dead and a number of others injured after a shooting in the city of Hamburg. Germany's interior minister says special forces were deployed along with a large number of police. It happened at a building in the city's Ulsterdorf area. Local media identified it as a Jehovah's Witness Center. Police say the gunman is believed to be among the dead. The federal government in Canada is proposing changes to terrorism laws allowing aid workers in Afghanistan to do their jobs in areas controlled by terrorists without being prosecuted for contributing to a terror group. And I want to be clear that stringent measures to prevent any financing from reaching terrorist groups like the Taliban will remain in place. But we will not let these laws stand in the way of doing the right thing. Since the Taliban's takeover, humanitarian groups have been warned buying goods or hiring locals would involve paying taxes to the Taliban. Under the changes, organizations can get an exemption provided they prove the benefits outweigh the risk of terror groups interfering with their work. Coming up, the pandemic's effect on our mental health. Members of Canada's women's national soccer team took their fight for equal, an equal playing field to Parliament today, giving powerful testimony about the ongoing dispute over pay equity and budget cuts at Canada Soccer and the culture of the governing body. I've never been more insulted than I was by Canada Soccer's own president, Nick Bontis, last year as we met with him to discuss our concerns. I was tasked with outlining our compensation ask on behalf of the women's national team. The president of Canada Soccer listened to what I had to say and then later in the meeting referred back to it as, quote, what was it Christine was bitching about? Nick Bontis resigned last week, acknowledging a change was needed at the top of Canada Soccer. And today, as the women's team testified, Canada Soccer released details of its proposed collective bargaining agreement, revealing both men and women will be paid the same amount per match and that both will have an equal share in competition prize money. The pandemic's lingering effects are everywhere, from the economy to mental health. Early on, when there was such a lack of knowledge about COVID-19, it was feared there would be a cascade of depression and anxiety that could last for years. But Canadian researchers suggest, on average, people are more resilient than we thought. Catherine Ward explains. We all know someone who struggled, or multiple people struggle with mental health. If you could rewind time... Who knows what's going on at this point? Do you remember how it felt throughout the pandemic? It's frustrating. We finally thought we'd get our senior year. 
the roller coaster. I hope that 2022 is a hell of a lot better than 2021 because that was terrible. Of skepticism and despair. It can't be worse. Hope and acceptance. I'd say realistically cautious. COVID-19 took a toll. However, new research suggests the extent of its effect on global mental health might be relatively limited. During much of the pandemic, you know, people have, have assumed that there would be a you know, tsunami was the word that was used, or mental health catastrophes. A Canadian-led research team went through 137 studies from around the world that tracked mental health indicators before and during the pandemic. For the most part, things either had not changed or had changed minimally. As human beings, we're very resilient. However, the study does note women have struggled more, which comes as no surprise to clinical psychologist Kathy Kamkar. Certainly a lot of stress, and then also hoping to be able to, to manage it all. Um, sometimes there is a tendency to engage in self-criticism or wanting to be a better person or a better mother or uh, this feeling of failure. The lead author notes there are some informational gaps they are still looking to fill. We had data on adolescents, but virtually none on children, so under 12 years old. We also didn't have data on people like those who are working in elder care or medical care. Still, the team believes this study highlights how when the chips were down, people came together. We helped each other along the way to prevent having some of those struggles. And that, you know, we can do this. We need to keep on keeping on. Catherine Ward, Global News, Toronto. Future flooding ahead. What's being done to mitigate rising sea levels in Canada? The changing climate has long been viewed by countries around the world as a looming threat to national security. In a newly released analysis, Canada's intelligence agency, CSIS, warns global warming poses a profound and ongoing threat to national security and prosperity, including the loss of parts of British Columbia and Atlantic provinces because of rising sea levels. Tonight, Alicia Drouse takes a look at what's being done to protect coastal communities. Predicting the rise of sea level is far from a perfect science, but based on decades worth of data, researchers have created models projecting scenarios up to 2100. That's in space of 80, meter, 80 years, it's giving you a, a, a sea level rise of one meter for the high CO2 scenario. Uh, for the low CO2 scenario, it's more like half a meter. At the Nova Scotia, New Brunswick border, the rising sea level is a big concern. Projections have suggested that the Chignecto Isthmus, which is home to the main transportation corridor between the two provinces, is at risk of being flooded by 2100. But the real worry is that flooding could actually be an issue much sooner. If there's a, uh, a hurricane during a high tide when the moon is full, we will get a flood and that flood will be extremely damaging. Three projects are being considered to protect the area, all focusing on reinforcing the dike system. But once a project is chosen, it will take 10 years to complete, time we may not have. A storm of a lifetime is now an annual event in Atlantic Canada. In BC, 80% of the population lives within five kilometres of the shoreline. There's people living in, in the floodplain that might be directly impacted, but we are also seeing uh, food security potentially at risk. In 2021, significant rainfall led to severe flooding in Abbotsford, killing hundreds of thousands of farm animals. While dikes and seawalls are often used to help protect such areas, landscape architect Case Lockman says relocation may be better to allow for more environmentally sustainable solutions. There's flood resilient crops and tradition or um, transition to uh, flood secure uh, food production. Uh, we could think about aquaculture or other types of um, uh, food security uh, elements that could work with water. Lockman says it's important to take steps now because while incremental sea level rise may not always be noticeable, disaster could strike at any time. Alicia Drouse, Global News, Amherst, Nova Scotia. Comedy duo next to Indigenous women having a laugh to help their community.
We all know how laughter can lift us, even help us heal. Well, there are a couple of women in B.C. who have teamed up to bring humour to their community and they're quickly gaining popularity through social media. Neetu Garcha has their story. <laughs> Lifelong friends with natural talent. Making people laugh by being themselves. Bev Prince and Winnie Sam describe themselves as dirty old grannies. Do you have any jokes you'd like to share with me right now? I don't know if it's appropriate. <laughs> for their content, not always suitable for younger fans. If I were a drum, he'd bang me. Oh my God. <laughs> They're from Nakaliwaten Nation near Fort St. James in northern BC. How do you decide what you're going to record? I think we just, we just wing it. We just wing it. <laughs> yeah. And they gave themselves traditional titles. I'm going to name myself um, Suga. Then two seconds later, Bev goes, I want to name myself Lilette. <laughs> so we're milk and sugar. <laughs> The names represent the great combination they make, but really the work was born out of a need for healing. It's a, like a survival skill sometimes. People saying that, you know, we really helped them because they were in the darkest place of their lives and they, they ran into a clip of our videos and it just brought them out. To return the joy they bring others, members of their community raised enough money to help the duo achieve their dream, to fly to Vancouver for a Canucks game later this month. We're gonna go and um, hopefully get on the big screen, the jumbo screen, and maybe they'll see a little bit of Lilette swinging their hips like they got no bone. It's sure to be quite the show, they hope, leaves people laughing and with a meaningful message. If you really need someone, just phone a friend. And to just keep laughing. <laughs> Neetu Garcha, Global News. Oh, they'd be a riot to hang out with. That is Global National for this Thursday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is Castle Mountain in Banff, Alberta. Thanks for watching. Neetu will be here at the Anchor Desk tomorrow, and I'll see you on Saturday for the new reality. Bye-bye.